Hi folks. In this video, I will discuss a few of the main points of The Virtue of Faith by Robert Adams. This article is actually chapter one of a book that Adams wrote called The Virtue of Faith. In the article, Adams makes some points about what kinds of beliefs are immoral to have. Now, we, we might think that having a belief is involuntary, and so it doesn't make sense to say that a belief can be immoral. Um, a belief seems to be involuntary insofar as we just believe what we think is true. And what we think is true is not something that we tend to consciously choose. But Adams argues that this is not the case. Some beliefs are morally wrong to have, and to have morally wrong beliefs for the Christian is to be committing a sin. <clears throat> I should say that what Adams argue, argues that is not the case is that um, beliefs are not um, can never be immoral. So Adams argues that some beliefs anyway can be immoral. <clears throat> it's just that we tend to think that beliefs can't be immoral because they are more or less involuntary. So let's see what Adams says. Adams assumes in this paper Christian belief he doesn't argue for it. He says, it is not my aim to justify Christian belief. The question we shall be concerned with is, what is virtuous about faith, given that it is true? In section one, cognitive sins, Adams says that, to be sure, not all cognitive failures are, uh, are morally false. So how do we know where to draw the line? <clears throat> That is, where do we draw the line between cognitive failures that are and those that are not moral faults? He gives three types of cognitive error that would be considered moral faults. The term cognitive here, by the way, just means the function of the mind that generates beliefs, judgments, and decisions, and other types of uh, activities like these, as opposed to, say, emotions or feelings. The three types of cognitive error that seem to be moral failings, uh, according to Adams, are false ethical beliefs, harmful beliefs due to negligence, and false beliefs that manifest bad desires. So first, let's take false ethical beliefs. Adams argues that someone who thinks that there's nothing wrong with shoplifting would be morally blameworthy, even if the person has never shoplifted. Incidentally, he allows that there might be some false ethical beliefs that are not sins, but uh, even if one has never shoplifted, there would be something wrong uh, and morally blameworthy with this belief. Second, in terms of harmful false beliefs, um, if anyone has a false uh, belief, a false moral belief, it doesn't. Um, it's blameworthy if they come come about it through negligence. So Adams gives the example of a child brought up in the Hitler Youth movement in Nazi Germany. Some people might think that the beliefs that such a young person would learn to have would not be morally blameworthy. But Adams disagrees. He says, bad moral beliefs can make a bad man or woman, no matter how we come by. How we come by that belief, I should say. How we come by the belief, not how we come by the police. <clears throat> Okay, interesting view by the belief, not by the police. Third, false beliefs 
are sometimes morally blameworthy, partly because we have them due to bad desires. So, for instance, if I have a belief that has come about because I have failed to recognize another person's feelings, that belief is morally blameworthy. This is because it is morally offensive to hold too high an opinion of oneself, and of course, for Christians, this is a sin. In section 2 on page 13, Adams discusses the relationship between a moral belief that is right and a moral belief that is reasonable. He argues that there is really no connection. A right ethical belief can be held in an unreasonable way, but that doesn't keep it from being to the moral credit of the person. For instance, say that someone is a utilitarian and believes that pleasure should always be maximized. Such a moral principle could lead to wrong actions, like hurting someone in order to create more pleasure than displeasure in the world, yet the belief would still be reasonable for a utilitarian. Adams argues that it is usually more important for moral beliefs to be right than to be reasonable. We are used to thinking that rationality is the paramount intellectual virtue, but we often have to set aside rationality when it comes to very important human activities. <clears throat> when we learn a language, when we trust people, or when we try to gain self-knowledge, we frequently have to believe things on insufficient evidence to be successful. In fact, Adams argues that when we rely on induction and trusting our judgments, we are actually guessing to a large extent. Now, induction in philosophy is a specific form of reasoning in which the premises of an argument support a conclusion but don't ensure it. Similarly, induction is how science operates. It is how we try to gain an understanding or knowledge of the world by systematic observations. Adams argues that this kind of knowledge can only be gained by making inferential jumps in reasoning, or as he puts it, by guessing. When we guess right, according to Adams, we are understanding God's signals. In section three, The Sin of Unbelief, Adams discusses the central form of the sin of unbelief in the Christian life, a failure to trust in truths to which one assents. What he means here is two things, two forms of sinful unbelief. One, not believing in God when he speaks to us, and two, not believing in God at all. To have fear that God will let me down means that I do not entirely trust him. A perfect trust in God would free me from that fear and for, from many others, says Adams. He wants to distinguish between three things. <clears throat> He wants to distinguish between recognizing, excuse me, <coughs> pardon me, recognizing that God's goodness is less than 100% probable, two, that we may fear that God will let us down, and three, that we might let the indecisiveness of the evidence for God's existence affect our action. In other words, if we try to factor all the arguments into our decisions about what to do, we might hedge our bet on God's goodness, which would surely be a sin of unbelief. Adams thinks this is wrong, or that it is wrong to factor indecision into our bet on God's love. Imagine the following example. If a hunter believes that the animal behind the bushes is a bear, but recognizes that there is some reason to think it might be another hunter, the evidence against his belief ought certainly to influence his conduct. But Adams argues that reasons to doubt other people's trustworthiness, on the other hand, should sometimes be totally ignored, as should our doubt about ethical principles. Sometimes uncertainty should not be factored into my decision-making process. Adams says that one motive for our over-reliance on rationality is a lust for control of my own life and its circumstances. We have an emotional attachment to rationality. <coughs> Pardon me. Because rationality has three functions. One, it enables us to know where we are going so we can plan, scheme, contrive, uh, or indulge a whim. 
Two, it tells us how to manipulate situations and people. And three, it gives us judgments of probability so we can limit our risks. But by succumbing to this power of lust for control, we are sacrificing freedom just for the desire to stay in control. Such control also leads us to curtail our hopes. If we can expect evil rather than good, we can feel stronger and more likely to be right. But to, excuse me, to expect evil over good is a powerful enemy of faith, argues Adams. He's inclined to think that the lust for control presupposes a lack of trust in God. In section four, The Advantage of Faith Over Sight, Adams argues that faith is more important and better than knowledge. His reason is this, <coughs> pardon me, if we had perfect knowledge of, for instance, what other people thought, and if we knew what they were going to do, we would have an attitude of control toward them. If I were to know exactly how you would respond to every move, I would be manipulating you as much as I manipulated a typewriter or any other inanimate object, according to Adams. He argues that the function of faith allows God to be in control, like the way some of our relationships, uh, where we open our lives to be influenced and partly shaped by the other person in ways that we cannot predict. This giving up of control allows us to be more open to new experiences and to grow than if we had knowledge about everything. Adam says, our actual uncertainty about what other people will do makes it possible to depend on another person in a way that is much more personal. So our trust in God and allowing God to be in control uh, allows us to have new experiences and allows us to grow from those experiences in a way that if we were to have knowledge of everything, we would just be more manipulative and we would have more lust for control. I hope that this video has helped you to understand this reading by Robert Adams. Thank you for your time and attention. Bye-bye.